Good morning and welcome to Member Focus Monday. I'm Christina Schaefer, Director of Social Media for HAR, and I'm joined by a returning guest this morning, HAR's Diversity and Inclusion Consultant, Tracy Brown. Welcome back to the program, Tracy. Good morning, Christina and everyone in HAR. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. You know, April's Fair Housing Month. We've d been discussing fair housing all month long. Um, but one thing that really, I think, was highlighted in last week's episode was when there are situations that occur, because they will occur, we, we know that they do occur, how do you handle them? And how, as an agent, are you supposed to deal with that situation? How as a broker should you train that situation? So Tracy is here to talk to us today about just that, how to deal with all of those sticky situations when they occur. Um, before we get into all of that though, Tracy, if you don't mind uh, introducing yourself for us, just a little bit about who you are and what you do. Sure. Um, the way I describe what I do, the work that I do in the world is, I think of it as I help people transform the conversation about inclusion from a debate about personalities and politics like to transform that into dialogue about relationships and business results. And uh, I do that by focusing on two things. One, what's the strategy? Like what's our vision? What's our plan? How does doing this apply to our mission or our shared goals? And secondly, uh, skills. What are the skills that we need to be able to communicate and lead in this world we live in, which is multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-generational, and it's not easy. Mm -hmm. So I help leaders and organizations really move forward in an intentional way toward being fair and inclusive. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and I know as a staff person, we get to uh, learn from you quite often. Um, you can maybe share a little bit about what HAR as staff have been doing to better serve our 51,000 members, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, within HAR, I, I feel really blessed because I get to work with members. I get to work with leadership, right? The executive mm -hmm. team and the board. And a lot of that work is focused, well, some of it's on strategy, and some of it is on skills. I also get to work with staff, which HAR has a very uh, diverse staff, a staff that represents many ethnicities, many national origins, all gender, all sexual orientation, and different age groups. We just recently did some work around multi-generational communication. And so again, with staff, it's still those two focuses. How do we serve members better, which is in line with the mission? Mm -hmm. And how do we develop the skills we need to be able to be effective at work and in serving the community? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for for that and of course for the work that you do uh, with us and, and with our leadership. You know, again, we've been talking about um, fair housing this month as it is fair housing month and highlighting the very real challenges that we still face to this day. Um, today, again, we wanna get into more ways on how to handle those sticky situations uh, when they arise. But before we, we dive into that and some of the tips and strategies that you have for us, um, last week, the term implicit bias came up on this program. Can you explain to us what is implicit bias and how does it differ from explicit bias and institutional bias? Great question, Christine. Mm -hmm. So first, let's just look at the word bias. Mm -hmm. What does bias mean? Bias is a belief or a prejudice for or against something. It's a belief we have or a prejudgment we have about something being good or bad, something being right for us, wrong for us, something we like, something we don't like. And so that's what a bias is. It's neutral. It is, that's just what bias is. We all have them in all aspects of our lives. But what gets confusing for people is they confuse bias with discrimination. 
And so people are quick to say, I don't have any biases, which isn't true. What is true is that we don't allow all of our biases to come out in our behavior in a way that results in discrimination. Mm -hmm. But I like chocolate ice cream versus strawberry ice cream. That's a bias, right? I roller skate on Sunday nights and uh, it's in my schedule. That's the reflection in my behavior of a bias that I love to roller skate and that I love to, um, the, I love the physical exercise of it as well as the social element. Mm -hmm. So we all have biases about the kinds of people we like or don't like or the kinds of situations that we're good in or not good in. So that's mm -hmm. bias. Once we realize that, then it's like, oh, wait a minute. We all have biases, but they don't show up the same. So implicit bias, which it did come up a lot last week. And I was watching going, does everybody know what that means? Implicit, <laughs> bias, implicit bias. So implicit bias means it's unconscious. It's, it's in us, but we're not intentionally acting upon it. We take it for granted, or it just drives the way that we communicate or the choices we make. We're not thinking about it. So that's an implicit bias. It's unconscious bias, and they're not all bad. As I already said, biases are not all bad. It's just the stuff we take for granted or we assume everybody knows. Our explicit biases are the ones that show up where we intentionally made a choice to treat a person a certain way or to say a certain thing, even knowing that it might be negative. So sometimes people will say in conversation, well, Tracy, you know, I'm not racist, but, and then they go on to say something that they know is going to be perceived as a racist or a negative in, negatively influenced by racism. So then I'm showing an explicit bias or in the real estate industry, when you have someone who says, I do not want to sell my home to a certain type of person, or as the one of the examples last week, I don't want to lease to a person in this category or identity group. That is an explicit bias that can and often does lead to discrimination. So you have bias in general, implicit bias or unconscious bias, explicit bias. And then the third is institutional bias. So let's just take the obvious example in real estate. Redlining is something that generated and created institutional bias. Realtors, lenders, banks, right? The, appraisers, the whole profession, it was institutionalized that there were certain areas that were better or preferred, and there were certain areas that were not. And so that is when it becomes in the structure. It's legislated, or there are policies that keep that unfair behavior happening in your life, in your community, in your industry, or in the world. So those are the distinctions. All bias is not the same. And we need to be careful when we say, oh, it's all about discrimination. Mm -hmm. It's not. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for explaining that. I think um, Shad last week did kind of mention when he was discussing implicit bias, it, maybe assuming when you see somebody and based on their appearances and what you think you may know about how they look deciding for them, maybe they want to live on this part of town, right? Um, so, and then explicit, of course, you just gave some really good examples of that. Um, and yeah. we did also talk about the um, institutional and talked about the book, The Color of Law a little bit last week as well, which is a wonderful, wonderful um, book that, you and I've both read, but it really defines the red lining you were just mentioning. Yeah, I agree with the comment made last week that 
<clears throat> every realtor should read that book mm -hmm. to understand not just the historical pattern, but to see how the historical pattern shows up in the 21st century mm -hmm. so that you can avoid that same behavior. Wonderful. Thank <clears throat> you. Um, so I want to talk about, like I mentioned, as an agent where we should, you know, really focus our attention, but also as a broker. So as an agent, um, and we've, we've discussed some different situations that come up, especially, you know, here in the Houston area, um, what is the best way to handle a sticky situation when, when it arises? And they will arise, mm -hmm. right? We're human, we're working with other human beings. <clears throat> Excuse me, those sticky situations are going to come up and they are, the situation itself might be a little unpredictable, but if you can think of these three words as you are formulating your response, it will be easier. So when I am in a sticky situation, a conversation, or I'm like, oh, ooh, whether it's, you know, it's almost always unintentional, mm -hmm. I think, okay, wait, responsibility, respect, results. Responsibility, respect, results. And what that does is it helps me formulate what I'm going to say or do. Number one, as we think about it today, my responsibility would be as a realtor, as a professional realtor, what's my responsibility? What are the professional standards that I have agreed to uphold? What, what is going to create fairness here? That's what my responsibility is. And side note, I've heard a few people say, well, my responsibility is to make the consumer or to make the client comfortable. No, your first responsibility is to be professional and to represent the profession well. Mm -hmm. the, second res the second piece, the second R, respect, is you want to handle your responsibility in a respectful way. So, of course, whatever you say or do is going to be respectful of the client or respectful of the buyer, or respectful of the seller, respectful of the consumer and respectful of yourself that you are living within boundary in the boundaries that respect yourself and then results, right? You want to stay focused on what's the result. Is the desired result or the shared goal for the consumer to make as much money as they can in this deal or transaction, maybe. And so you do want to focus on that, but it is number three in those three R's. Or you want to focus on maybe the result is you're building a reputation in the industry as someone who engages with people from many different communities or backgrounds. And so, how might that sound or look? Responsibility, respect, and results. So it may be that someone asks you to do something that is not in line, not in alignment with the professional standards. So as Shad actually modeled last week, you know, as a profession, you might say, as a professional realtor, or as a realtor in our profession, we have standards that hold us to a higher level mm -hmm. to make sure that everyone is treated fairly, right? You might start with a comment that is not attacking and it's not defensive. It is just a statement. These, this is my responsibility here. Mm -hmm. Respect. I really want to work with you and I hope that, you know, we are going, going to work together. And uh, at the same time, I want to make sure that I protect you from any potential lawsuit or anything that could get you in trouble. Mm -hmm. Respectfully setting standards and then the results, you know, and my, with my track record, I am sure I can bring you the renters or I can bring you the buyers 
that are going to be interested in your property and then you go to the result. You know, our track record is to close this kind of deal in 30 days or less and you reinforce the business results that you want to achieve for that consumer. Mm -hmm. And it's, but in your mind, you cannot think there's a script, but there is a guideline, responsibility first, respect second, and then go back to the business results. Is that helpful? Absolutely. And if somebody would type that, anybody who's watching, type that in the chat so everybody can remember that. <laughs> Responsibility, respect, results. I, I love that. Um, thank you so much for that, Tracy. I think that's really helpful. I want to get into the broker side and how to train your agents, but we did uh, want to back up just a second. We had a question from Felita about bias, um, more maybe more of a clarification, but it says, it sounds like the definition of bias could be synonymous to the definition of preference. Do you have any thoughts on that, Tracy? Yeah, so often uh, we will talk about bias as a synonym to prejudice. And you can often equate preference with prejudice, but often, but also a lot of people, when they use the word preference, it's conscious. Mm -hmm. I consciously choose to prefer A over B. Whereas bias is really a little more subtle, especially unconscious bias, is a lot more subtle that we don't even realize that we are leaning in that direction until somebody brings it to our attention mm -hmm. or until something happens that makes us go, oh, I didn't even realize I thought that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, bias, synonym with prejudice. And yes, you could stretch it to preference, but just be a little careful about that. Okay, very good, thank you so much. Um, so as a broker, for any brokers that are, are tuned into this program, how would you recommend that they go about training their agents um, to handle any kind of sticky situations that they're in from the, from the broker side? Well, the worst, let's start with the worst thing you can do. Okay. <laughs> and then to get back to what you want to do instead. Yeah. <laughs> the worst thing you can do is wait until there is a problem. Mm -hmm. And there are two reasons for that. One, when you're reacting to the problem of the moment, it's more anxiety ridden there's a lot of pressure to react right now. Um, and you don't have the opportunity to take a breath and think through it often. Mm -hmm. The other reason you don't want to wait and be reactive only is because you won't access right the best response because you're just trying to be quick and you'll tend to do lip service instead of actually develop some liberating or some really dynamic skills that can be used. So instead, instead of waiting until there is a problem, <clears throat> prepare in advance. So be proactive, mm -hmm. provide training, build it, build something into your orientation and into your, into your team meetings that helps people begin to think about not only the problems you want to protect yourself from, but also the opportunities that are in the Houston metropolitan market because there is so much diversity. Mm -hmm. And so when you're proactive, you have the opportunity to teach and enforce the lesson that paying attention to the diversity in the market is creating business opportunity for you versus so many people who are still, well, the only reason we have to talk about diversity is it's a problem. Oh, well, you know, it's, it's going to create a big drama or it's a lot of conflict and we have to know how to solve it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's true. 
but more often it's an untapped opportunity to reach more people, to, to sell more property, to engage with different organizations. Other things that brokers might want to keep on the radar is focus on the responsibility, not the problems, which is kind of a way to summarize what I just said. Mm -hmm. uh, air articles and really as a broker, publicize and attend and support the HAR and the NAR programs that are on related topics, right? There's certification mm -hmm. programs, There's web there are webinars available. There are all kinds of resources that are available in NAR and HAR. And brokers have the responsibility, I think, to say to the agents, here's something that will help you build and grow and sustain your business. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you mentioned um, two words that I, I know every realtor uh, wants to pay attention to, and that's untapped markets, right? <laughs> They're always looking to grow and expand, and there's some untapped markets that you could be uh, missing out on. So excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, Tracy. Um, if you have questions for Tracy, type them into the comments and we will get to as many as we can. We've got some thank yous for clarification and this is great and some good comments going on. But if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in. So um, realtors, you know, they're not always just working within their brokerage, right? They're working with other agents from all around the Houston area with different brokerages. And they're also working with a lot of industry partners as well. Um, so when working with other agents or industry partners, what are some things that you'd recommend our members just keep in mind when it comes to fair housing? Number one to keep in mind, fair housing is not just about providing housing to poor black people. Mm. Um, and I'm going to say it like that because from what I've heard from realtors, there are still a lot of realtors who think this is, you know, or fair housing laws and fair housing programs are only for people who are really poor or in poverty or only for people, maybe all people of color, but most frequently referred to are black people and in Texas. Um, the Latino community as well. So that's number one. To re I would say remember that fair housing is about professional standards. It's not about political inconvenience. It's not about you know different personalities of people. It's about what professional standards, you know, what standards has the profession said we want to live up to. Another thing I think to remember is. If I'm working with other agents or other industry partners, I've got to be open to hearing the experience of agents or industry, partment, industry partners who are different from me or who work with different types of consumers than I do. How am I going to know what are some important cultural norms to keep in mind about who makes decisions or who should be involved in the decision-making process for my um, clients who culturally are from India. If I don't ask questions and then listen to the advice of my colleague who actually works with that clientele, 30% of their business has been built on it. Same thing, whether it's related to age, you know, different generations or people who are from a different sexual orientation or gender expression group than I am. Um, and we, we fall into, and I say we, because I do it too. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I had to catch myself and I'll see that I'm falling into a trap of thinking, I'm a professional. I have all these decades of experience. I know what I need to know. And I forget that I don't know everything. 
A couple other things that come to mind if we're working with other agents or uh, lenders or mortgage brokers, uh, you know, working with other people in the industry. I would say it's really important to get involved with community and nonprofit organizations because that's like, can, can we come to some common ground or can I learn from this nonprofit association or organization? And in my mind, that includes being involved with the affiliated real or associations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, recently there was the, a great event where representatives, you know, I say recently because I know everybody said there'll be people who are watching the recording. But at the time that we're speaking, just last week, mm -hmm. there was a great event with over 100 agents and real estate professionals coming together to learn about the experience of realtors from different ethnic groups, different age groups, different um, age, different gender, all of the differences that, yes, we're all realtors and like not yes, but, but yes, and we have a different experience or many of our clients have different needs. So we have to be the ones to take the uh, first step to build a bridge between our experience and the experience of others who are different from us, not to make either one of us right or wrong, but to access a bigger piece of the industry pie. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so accidents happen. We all make mistakes. As you said, you make mistakes. I make mistakes. Um, so what what should you do if you um, maybe find yourself in a situation where you haven't violated a fair housing law, but you have unintentionally offended someone? What are some ways to handle that situation? Yeah, and this is what happens 90, per, 90 or 95% of the time. It is how we see our unconscious or implicit biases show up and we learn that we have misstepped or misspoken mm -hmm. and we have unintentionally offended someone or you know offended is a strong word mm -hmm. we've unintentionally created some discomfort we've unintentionally we've told a joke that we think is funny and we don't realize the implication of it to someone else, mm -hmm. right? We're not bad people. And so how do we recover, which is the question. First, remember that you have a lot of experience recovering from offending people in your life. You have not gotten to today without ever offending someone. <laughs> we know how to do this. But somehow when we think it's related to diversity, we get nervous and we are like, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. Rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> so when I think about how do I recover when I offend a friend of mine or I say something that makes um, another member of my church uncomfortable and I find out about it. Oh. So Tracy does think in threes often, and Tracy does have use alliteration to remember things. So of course, Tracy has three words to remind me what to do when I unintentionally offend someone. All of them start with an A, and they are appreciate, apologize, and adapt. Appreciate, apologize, and adapt. What does that mean? You find out that you unintentionally made someone uncomfortable or said the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Appreciate the person who let you know. Say thank you. For me, that often sounds like, OMG, 
uh, thank you for telling me because otherwise I wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes it sounds like, wow, thank you for being brave enough to tell me because I know it wasn't easy for you, right? So appreciate getting the feedback. Start there. Do not start from a defensive place. Do not start with defending your intention. Well, I didn't mean anything by, no, do not start there. Start with appreciate getting the feedback. And they might be mad when they're telling you because you were the straw that broke the camel's back. And so you might have to say, oh, I see you're really upset. Thank you for coming to me anyway. So appreciate. Number two, um, apologize. Then you apologize for the impact it had. I'm so sorry that that came across that way. Or, wow, I didn't know I, that that would mean that to you or to that group. Um, and I am sorry. And then adapt. Find out what you need to do or make a commitment to not do that again and to do something different. So it may be adapting in the moment like, please tell me what, what language I should use instead. Mm -hmm. And then repeat it so that you are beginning to adapt your behavior in the moment. Or it may be more something like, wow, in our next team meeting, I'm going to bring this up and we're all going to have a conversation about it and then take that action. So adapt could also be action. Mm -hmm. In my mind, I think of it as how am I going to adapt to my behavior so I get a different result in the future. So the three things you want to keep in mind, if you have unintentionally offended someone and you get that feedback, it's like, say it with me, uh, appreciate, apologize, and then adapt or take action. Excellent. Thank you. And Juana already read my mind. She typed it into the comments for us. And I think, um, you know, I, I, I think that helps solidify it. Just writing it out. Um, you know, earlier we discussed um, the three R's that you mentioned. Um, and now we have three A's. So we have responsibility, respect, results. And now we have appreciate, apologize, and adapt. I love it. Thank you. I think that makes it easier for all of us to remember, Tracy. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's important because in the moment, we have to have something to trigger us to respond and not just react. And again, going back to you made a statement earlier that you it, it's not a script, right? It, because every situation is going to be different and require different levels of, you know, maybe even appreciation, apo apologizing and, and adapting. So uh, it's not a script, but that formula, if you will, I think is is really helpful to try to remember um, when you are in those situations. Um, so we you mentioned adapt can also be action. Um, let's talk about how they can take action now. How can realtors get better educated about handling difficult or even illegal situations when they arise? Wow, you know we could do two hours just <laughs> on this question. <laughs> but I am very much aware that we are time limited on member mm -hmm. focus Monday. So I'm going to share, well, I think in threes. So I'm going to share three tips, a book tip, a behavior tip, and a business tip. So the book tip, my favorite book for, for anyone and everyone in any and every industry in terms of how do I respond in my behavior to those kinds of situations is the book Subtle Acts of Exclusion, mm -hmm. How to Understand, Identify, and Stop Microaggressions. And I can hold it up because I actually keep this book if not within arm's reach on the shelf by me, I have it within two steps reach on the bookcase. <laughs> so I find myself referring to it a lot. Subtle acts of exclusion, 
how to understand, identify, and stop microaggressions. And really, microaggressions are just those things we do, mostly from unconscious or implicit bias. And the, it, the book is great. Number two, book tip, behavior tip. Um, one of the most important things you can do to get educated about handling different types of situations is to build the relationships in advance that will help you. When, you know, when I think about where I learned much of what is really important or what, what skills I developed, a lot of them came because I built relationships with people who were different from me. So within the real estate industry, within Houston, it's another place, go join one or two of the affiliate groups that are, that are focused on um, identities that are not your own and build relationships with people. So you have somebody you can call and say, hey, what about this? Or I read this article um, yesterday and I'm trying to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. So that would be the behavioral thing, build relationships in some way. And then the business related is really intentionally build your skills. Take, I said this earlier, but I cannot emphasize it enough take classes, get your certifications, you know, go, go on the NAR site and do Fairhaven. That was mentioned um, in previous Member Focus Mondays. Um, get your certification in At Home with Diversity. Mm -hmm. Watch the list of uh, webinars and programs that the HAR Education and Professional Development team sends out. At least once a quarter, there's something related to diversity and inclusion. And if you don't take advantage of that before you need it, then you are going to feel completely overwhelmed when a situation comes up. So a book tip, behavior-based tip, build relationships, and a business-related tip intentionally build your skills in advance. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tracy. Well, you've shared quite a bit with us this morning, um, but before we go, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us today? Of course. <laughs> Let me take a breath and think, what haven't I, what maybe haven't I said or that I need to reinforce? Number one, um, there is a lot in, in our state, uh, a lot of tension around even using the word diversity. Mm -hmm. But usually that's because people equate diversity with race or racism. Race and racism is one aspect of diversity, but I want to remind you and reinforce for you that when we say within HAR, when we say the word diversity, we are talking about all the ways that we are different from one another in terms of the being one of the places, and many people will say the most diversity in the United States. Number two, um, related to that is inclusion is not the default because we're not trained to do that. So I do want to remind you that inclusion requires intentional activity. And that's what I'm trying to encourage you to do. And then, um, Maybe I'm not the best one to say this, but I've been thinking about it for the past two weeks. So I'm going to share it with all of you. And that is that, yes, April is Fair Housing Month, but HAR is committed to fair housing all year long. And as a professional realtor, that, that needs to be a part of your mindset and the way that you run your business. And if there's any way that I can help through the professional development at HAR that's offered by HAR, or if you're working with staff on customer service and their challenges, you know, I'm here to help HAR service members in the most effective way, because we want y'all to make a lot of money. <laughs> right? And we want to build happy communities. And so um, I'm really honored mm. that I have the privilege to work with realtors in general and with HAI specifically. 
thanks for inviting me today. Thank you so much, Tracy. This was wonderful. Um, a lot of thank yous going in the comments. Uh, and one uh, comment that actually CJ just said, thank you, Christina and Ms. Tracy for having this important conversation. But earlier, I wanted to point out CJ's comment. She said, uh, knowledge is power, applied knowledge is powerful. And I just loved that comment. <laughs> yes, yes. Absolutely. Okay, well, uh, before we go, I uh, do want to let everyone know that next Monday, we will be back to dive a little deeper into rental situations that uh, it, it came up last week in the conversation we had with Shad Bogany. And there were so many questions around rentals. As we know, rentals are um, are everywhere. Everybody's renting, it seems like. 58% uh, of Houstonians are renting. Um, so there's a lot of our members that are gonna be dealing with rentals or all already dealing with rentals. Uh, and we wanna best prepare you for how to handle situations that may come up when you're working with either uh, tenants or landlords. So um, that's what we'll be discussing next week with Mike Mingdon. So set your calendars next Monday at 9 a.m. I will see you then. Thank you again, Tracy, for your time today. Bye-bye. <laughs>